Obsessing about revenge. That's what this case is about. Obsession with getting revenge is what was on the defendant's mind the early morning hours of November 25th of 2010. The only thing on his mind those early morning hours of that Thanksgiving morning in 2010, when he shot and killed two innocent victims, two brothers, Juan and Sergio Guitron, and tried to kill four other victims who fortunately survived the horrifying events of those early morning hours. Those four victims being Richard Cantu, Ramon Galan, Gonzalo Guevara, and Mr. Daniel Beltran. In order for you to understand how we got to the obsession with revenge on November 25th of 2010, we need to go back to January of 2010. Almost to the day 11 months prior to the horrifying incidents of that Thanksgiving morning, where in January of 2010, when the defendant, Michael Keatley, was working as an ice cream truck driver in the Ruskin area, and he was robbed by a black female and two black males. The black female had approached his ice cream truck and had attempted to make a purchase when two black males came up, robbed him of $12, and shot him. Mr. Keatley sustained injuries, and he contacted law enforcement, where the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office began their investigation as to that robbery of Mr. Keatley. They obtained a description for Mr. Keatley, that being of a black female, and two black masked males, and a description of the suspect's vehicle. Law enforcement, as they do in all of these kinds of cases, began their investigation, working on leads that they were able to have, working off of the information that Mr. Keatley provided to them. And unfortunately, they were not able to make any arrests in that robbery investigation. They were not able to identify any suspects. And Mr. Keatley was upset about that. He was upset that he had been injured and that no one was going to pay for that. He was upset that law enforcement was not able to complete and close out that investigation with an arrest. So he decided he was going to do his own investigation. He was going to go out and speak to witnesses. He was going to try to obtain evidence. And as this case will unfold over these next several weeks, you will learn from numerous witnesses about what he did in his investigation. He spoke to people in the neighborhood he conducted research, website research on his laptop. He obtained firearms. <clears throat> and as his investigation unfolded, word on the street was that Hispanic individuals, Hispanic males were in fact responsible for the robbery. Not the individuals, not of the individuals of the race that he ultimately had identified or had provided to law enforcement. And that he had uncovered these Hispanic males were the ones who ultimately had caused him harm and had robbed him. And as he is uncovering this information, as the word on the street provided him, that a person by the name, a Hispanic, na a Hispanic male by the name of Creeper, nicknamed Creeper, his name ultimately being learned was Omar Bayan, was in fact one of the individuals who had robbed him. And so when Mr. Keatley gets that information, you will learn as this case unfolds and viewing evidence and exhibits in this case, that he researched and spoke to people about Creeper. He told his friends, his girlfriends, look for Creeper, look for a man 
with the nickname Creeper tattooed on his arm. This is what he is telling his friends and his girlfriends over this 11 month period. And as he's conducting his own investigation, he learns that this creeper man lives at 507 Ocean Mist Court. And why is that important? Because this horrifying incident that occurred on November 25th of 2010 was at the address of 604 Ocean Miss Court, just down the street from the home of this creeper person. The defendant, you will hear from witnesses, enlisted his friends to help him in his investigation. Not only look for this creeper, but he had a female by the name of Norma Jean Towers who he had drive through this area looking for creepers, dri um, driver's uh, tag. The defendant covered, him, covered his face up, wore a hat and covered his face up as he had her drive through the neighborhood looking for tags, that he was gonna be able to complete his investigation. He had offered a reward that he had signed, he had posted on his ice cream truck offering a $5,000 reward to help him find this creeper individual. You'll have testimony from witnesses that he approached a 13-year-old girl and interrogated her to tears, trying to find out information about creeper. You'll hear that he hired his friend, David Beckworth, to be his muscle after the incident that had occurred in January where he was injured. And David Beckwork worked with him with the ice cream truck to help protect him and to help find this creeper. And David Beckworth had agreed to help his friend find creeper and take him down. The agreement was to dress up like cops, hunt them down and kill them. But as this case unfolds, you will hear testimony from witnesses, for example, Ms. Logan, who's gonna tell you that, that those early morning hours of November 25th of 2010, David Beckworth wasn't with my, Michael Keatley. He was with her at her family gathering, preparing for the Thanksgiving day, smoking a turkey. So although the plan was for David Beckworth and the defendant, <clears throat> to gun down this creeper. Mr. Beckworth was not with Michael Keatley those early morning hours when this horrific incident took place on Thanksgiving morning. Law enforcement did continue to attempt to conduct their investigation. Mr. Keatley would take law enforcement, the leads and the information that he had, but he was not able to give them any witness names that they could go and, and gather an ultimate witness to say, how do you know Creeper was in fact involved in this robbery? And it was also concerning to law enforcement that he had originally identified a black female and two black males. And now he was saying it was a Hispanic males, one with the nickname Creeper. And this obsession with revenge is festering festering and festering from January until November 25th of 2010. And you will see that from the evidence, from the laptop research forensic evidence. He looked up Bayan, who belongs to Omar Bayan, 11 times. He looked up law enforcement 22 times. He looked up Ocean Mist 92 times. He looked up Glock, as in the Glock firearm, 2,353 2, times. He looked up Uniform 3,996 times. And as you learn the facts of this case, you will understand why Glock and Uniform become important. 
he looks up Omar 11,602 times on his laptop. Let's talk about what happened those early morning hours of November 25th, 2010, approximately in the two hour in the morning time frame. That Wednesday night, the 24th, the day preceding Thanksgiving into the early morning hours, the victims were friends and they had decided to gather at 604 Ocean Mist Court because they didn't have to work the next day. So they were going to hang out, have some drinks, play cards on the front porch of Ocean Miss Court. And Juan and Sergio, Daniel Beltran, Gonzalo Guevara, Ramon Galone, Richard Cantu, Jose, uh, Jose Rodriguez were all there hanging out that night. They were drinking beers, they were playing poker cards, and three of the victims did partake in drugs, in marijuana and cocaine. And you will hear that as they were sitting there on that front porch of Ocean 604 Ocean Mist Court, those early morning hours, they see a dark colored minivan come down the street, which was a little odd because it was so early in the morning, 2 a.m. So they notice the vehicle and then it comes back towards the home and pulls up at the end of the driveway of that home. And as they are looking at the vehicle, as they are sitting there on the porch, as they had been hanging out earlier, they see a white male individual exit that dark colored minivan. And that individual is wearing a black t-shirt with a law enforcement name in white big block letters, either police or sheriff across the, the shirt. And he has a gun in his hand. And so they are thinking, some of them that had the drugs that were still there, oh, there's law enforcement, they need to put the drugs away. So as this individual, this lone gunman approaches, who they believe to be law enforcement, who they believe to be a law enforcement officer at the time, approaches the steps of this front porch. And they, wonder what this law enforcement officer wants of them. Well, this individual, this white male dressed in a black shirt with white block lettering, dark green and black pants, camo style pants, demands where's Creeper? Where is Creeper? Who is Creeper? And has his firearm. Law, uh, these individuals, the victims, on the porch. They know Creeper, they know Omar Bayon, but Omar Bayon that night is not there. He was not on the porch on November 25th of 2010. And as you'll recall, I told you his address, as the defendant had learned through his own investigation, was actually 507 Ocean Mist Court. But there were multiple Hispanic males out on that French port that early morning. And as this Gunman, who at that point they still think is a law enforcement officer, is demanding where's Creeper. The law enforcement who the law enforcement officer demands they pull out their identification cards to see if they're telling the truth, which they do. He tells them to get down, which they do. They get down on their knees. They pull out their driver's license. And Creeper, Omar Bayan is not there. That's when, one by one, execution style, the defendant shoots the victims. This lone gunman is there, and when the first victim is shot, that's when. The prosecutor's telling an excellent story here. What do you think so far? She's really setting things up because in order to understand what this case is really about, you have to understand the backstory and what happened to ice cream man Michael Keatley. We're going to hit the pause button. You won't miss a thing. We'll be right back live after this break. This is a case of revenge. An ice cream man is mugged, beaten, and robbed. 
Now he stands accused of murder. He became obsessed with finding who shot him. Was this a vigilante double homicide, or is it a case of mistaken identity? The Ice Cream Man Murder Retrial, today on Court TV. Back to Court TV Live. I'm your host, Julie Grant. We're seeing the opening statements in an incredible trial, the Ice Cream Man murder trial. You loyal courties will remember this one. This one was such a good one. Ended with a hung jury the first time, so this is the second go around. We're watching to see what the state is doing differently. You haven't missed a second. We hit the pause button for you. Let's go back in together now. Strong diamond is there, and when the first Victim is shot, that's when they realize this is not a law enforcement officer. None of them have guns on them. None of the victims were armed the early morning hours. And as you will hear testimony from the surviving victims in this case, you'll hear testimony as to what they remember. And you'll hear that one by one, they heard the shots of their friends. <coughs> in the backs of their bodies as they were kneeling on that front porch. <clears throat> you will hear testimony from the medical examiners in this case, Dr. Mary Mainland, who conducted the autopsies of Sergio and Juan Guitron. And before Dr. Meehlin responds to that scene, you will hear that ultimately when Sergio and Juan Guitron are shot and, and killed and the other victims are there, two individuals are able to flee from that porch ultimately after the victims were shot. <clears throat> you have Jose Rodriguez who was there who was able to flee and was never injured. He is the one individual that would never sustain the gunshot wound those early morning hours. And you'll hear from Daniel Beltran. He was shot multiple times, but he was able to flee once he soon realized that this individual who he thought was a law enforcement officer approaching that porch was not, was anything but a law enforcement officer. You will hear that since they were unarmed, they were not able to defend themselves. You will hear from Daniel Beltran how he tried to get his friend's attention at the beer bottles that were just in front of them because he thought maybe they could use the beer bottles to defend themselves those early morning hours as one by one his friends were being shot around him. The victims, the surviving victims in this case, will tell you there was one gunman and there was one gun. Ultimately, Sergio sustained one gunshot wound to his back. Juan Guitron su sustained two gunshot wounds to his back. Each one of those taken individually were both fatal. Each one was fatal in and of itself. Richard Cantu was shot in the back of his head. And he, unfortunately or fortunately, however you look at it, has no memory of this incident. Gonzalo Guevara was shot four times, including in his back. Ramon Galan was shot on the right side of his body that traveled through his stomach and exited out the other side of his body. Daniel Beltran was shot three times in his hip, his chest, and had a graze to his face. And he was, he was one that was able to escape. You will hear these victims testify about what they went through, what they observed, what they were thinking those early morning hours of November 25th 
of 2010. You will hear from them that they were rushed to the hospital. All of the victims were taken to hospitals or um, by ambulance or taken by air to the hospital, all but Sergio Guitron. He was left at the scene and pronounced deceased on that front porch of 604 Ocean Mess Court. Juan Guitron was later pronounced deceased at the hospital. And law enforcement began their investigation soon thereafter, soon after this incident occurred. They arrive on scene, they secure the scene. They learn where, what hospitals the victims were being transported to. They start documenting the scene marking items of evidence that were left behind on that front porch and in the area surrounding that front porch, such as shell casings, wallets, driver's license that were left behind. Ultimately, they collect those items of evidence that were sent off for testing, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Law enforcement conducts interviews. As we are nearing the top of the hour, you know we need to hit a break. I want to address something I'm getting a lot of questions about on Twitter. And believe me, I'm asking the same thing. I see those children in the gallery. Many of you have asked, who are they? Why are they there? Is this appropriate? We have a team in the courtroom, as you know, uh, covering this trial. And they're going to work on getting some answers when it's an appropriate time during a break, when they're able to talk to the folks in the gallery. So uh, we're wondering, too. Thank you for tweeting along. Keep the tweet coming. We're so glad you are joining us this morning for this brand new trial here on Court TV, the Ice Cream Man murder trial. We're going to hit a break and then go back into the courtroom together for more of the prosecution's opening statements. Thank you for watching Court TV Live. Seventy two. Call now. Good Monday morning to you, and thank you so much for being with us here on Court TV Live. I'm your host, Julie Grant. We've got a brand new live trial starting for you right now here on Court TV. It is the Ice Cream Man murder trial. And this defendant's face is probably going to look familiar to you if you've been watching since we relaunched in 2019. Michael Keatley already went to trial, and it was a hung jury. His attorney the first time says that the split was 10 to 2 in favor of acquittal. The state is saying he engaged in vigilante justice, trying to go after the people that shot him in an armed robbery of his ice cream truck, leaving him paralyzed. Let's go back into the courtroom now for more of the state's opening statements. Law enforcement conducts interviews of individuals that may have information about this case. And ultimately, when the victims are able the surviving victims, when they are able to provide a statement to law enforcement, law enforcement meets with them in the hospital. And they learn of a description provided by the victims. This white male, one individual with the black t-shirt with the white law enforcement lettering and the dark camo pants with one gun. The description that law enforcement obtained from multiple victims in this case. The dark colored minivan. And they learn of the identity that this individual had been asking for Creeper and had demanded to see their driver's license. Law enforcement learns Creeper's nickname is linked to Omar Bayon. They also interview other individuals, such as Stacy Rogan, who after, when she hears about this incident the day after, Friday, November 26, hears that multiple Hispanic males had been shot at over on Ocean Mix Court, she reaches out to law enforcement. And she tells law enforcement that she used to date Michael Keatley. And he had told her if she sees a man, a Hispanic male with the name Creeper tattooed on his arm, for her to call him. Call Michael Keatley. Don't call law enforcement. Call me, is what he told her.
Law enforcement follows lead upon lead upon lead in this investigation. They speak to Mr. Gorvara, who was still in the hospital, who had been sedated for several days after his injuries. And ultimately, Gonzalo Gravara makes an identification in a photo pack. You will hear testimony about that. You also hear testimony from a prior hearing where Jose Rodriguez, who was not injured fortunately that night, but he also makes the identification in that hearing of Michael Keatley being on that porch, being the lone gunman, early morning hours of November 25th of 2010. All of this investigation that law enforcement is conducting leads them to the defendant, Keatley, where they interview him on November 27th, just a few days after Thanksgiving. They interview him and they ask him, they asked him if the word on the street is that Creeper is responsible for his robbery. What does he tell them? No. He's asked if he ever heard about a guy named Creeper. He responds, no. He's asked if he ever asked anyone else about the person named Creeper. He responds, no. You will hear testimony in this case, witness after witness that will sit in this chair and tell you all that Michael Keatley told them about Creeper. In that interview, Michael Keatley also admits to law enforcement that he owned a Glock 21 that shoots 45 caliber. Why is that important? The shell casings and the projectiles left behind at the scene of 604 Ocean Miss Quarter, 45 caliber. They were left on around the front porch and under the front porch, which is consistent with what the victims had said is that they were kneeling down or down on the porch when they were shot. The following day, after the 27th of the interview of Michael Keatley, law enforcement responds to the Keatley property the Keatley residence, it is a huge property where multiple homes are located on. So on the 28th, law enforcement is continuing with their investigation. They have searches of the home, the property. They obtain numerous firearms. Mr. Keatley was an avid gun owner as well as his family. They obtained numerous firearms during the search of that home. There are shooting areas on that home and that property where there are items that were ultimately collected. Most importantly, a 45 caliber projectile near a van that had been used as target practice. There was a burn pit where a 45 caliber shell casing had been located. Multiple guns were recovered on the 28th during law enforcement search, except one important one, the Glock 21 that shot 45 caliber. A laptop was recovered from the Keatley home, as well as a composition notebook that was sitting on the kitchen counter. A composition notebook that on the first page when you open it up, has Omar Bayon 507 Ocean Mist written on it. Law enforcement collects that. Ultimately, testing is done on that comp composition notebook. Latent fingerprint is lifted from the inside cover of that notebook as well as the page where Omar Bayon and his address is written down. That fingerprint is matched to none other than Michael Keith. Let's talk about the evidence that 
was sent off for testing that was ultimately collected from the scene the projectile found at that shooting target on the Keatley property and the shell casing that was found in that burn pit on the Keatley property. In addition to other shell casings that were obtained by law enforcement during this investigation. And they obtained other shell casings in this investigation from an acquaintance of Michael Keatley, who was Mr. Wesley Smith. Mr. Wesley Smith is a machinist. He and his coworkers would frequently buy ice cream from the defendant following his injury. And one day, the defendant engaged in conversation with Mr. Smith. And the defendant had learned that Mr. Smith is a machinist and Mr. Smith will tell you that typically being a machinist and people who are into to firearms are typically asked, do you work on firearms? Do you make any kind of modifications to firearms? And so Mr. Smith, being an avid gun owner himself, him and Mr. Keatley had this common ground and, and spoke about firearms often. And ultimately, one time, Mr. Keatley even invited Mr. Smith and his wife, Ms. Carmen Smith, over to his home, where they shot firearms together. Mr. Keatley fired his firearm, his Glock 45. Mr. Keatley allowed Mr. Smith to fire the Glock 21 that shot out 45 calibers. Ms. Smith was also there and observed all of this. And Mr. and Mrs. Smith picked up the shell casings after. They tend to recycle them. Um, and also they were concerned about the livestock that were on the property, potentially getting into those. And so when Mr. Smith was interviewed in this investigation, he had told law enforcement that he and his wife, when they had previously been to the Keatley home a few weeks before the incident on November 25th of 2010, that he had shell casings from that shooting get together. And he provided them to law enforcement. He didn't know if they would be helpful. So ultimately you will hear from Jennifer Clark who is a, an analyst with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, which is an accredited lab that conducts ballistics um, examinations. And it's not just looking at a shell casing and looking at another one from the eye and saying, oh, they're both Winchester, they match. This is microscopic comparisons done by an individual who is trained and who looks at these microscopic comparisons comparing one to the other and making a determination at these markings that are placed on the shell casings when the bullet is fired, when it ejects out of the firearm, comparing those, as well as comparing markings on the projectile that is shot through the barrel of the gun. She looks at the markings left on these pieces of evidence to make determinations as to whether or not they came from the same firearm and sometimes if they came from a particular firearm. So you will hear testimony that she had projectiles from the scene in this case, 45 caliber projectiles that were recovered from the 604 Ocean Miss Court. She had shell casings that were left behind at 604 Ocean Miss Court. And that she determined that those shell casings all matched as having come from the same firearm. And that the projectiles that were left at the scene, the 45 caliber projectiles, all came from the same firearm. She ultimately also compared the shell casing from the burn pit off of the defendant's property as matching the shell casings from Ocean Miss Court and that the projectile from the shooting target on the Keatley property matched the projectile from the projectiles at Ocean Miss Court. She is not able to say if they in fact came from the Glock 21 that Mr. Keatley owned because that was never recovered. I can tell you right now, the ballistics evidence is going to be a huge point of contention during this trial. It's really fascinating, folks, because you're going to hear a whole nother story when the defense gets up there. Don't go anywhere. We have to hit a break. We're going to get you right back into the courtroom for more of the state's opening statement. 
here on Court TV Live. A budding romance allegedly cut short by a jealous ex-boyfriend. The defendant told him, my ex was getting serious with this guy, and she was happy. Single father of two missing for nearly three years. We have no explanation of what happened to him. We have no explanation of where Mr. Anderson would have put a body. Court TV cameras are taking you inside the courtroom as this case unfolds. The obsessed ex-boyfriend murder trial today on Court TV. Quote today. Court TV Live, I'm Julie Grant. Let's get you back into the courtroom. We're in Florida today for the Ice Cream Man murder trial. We're in the middle of the state's opening statements. Let's go back in where we left off. She will also tell you that the shell casings match coming from a Glock. She is not able to tell you that the projectiles came from a Glock. How is that possible? That is possible, and as the case unfolds and the evidence is presented, that if someone changes the barrel, places a aftermarket barrel on the firearm, it won't and it's not, if it's not a Glock, so basically you have a Glock firearm, you change the barrel to an aftermarket barrel. Those projectiles will not match as having come from a Glock because it's, an, it's a change that has been made. And when ballistic comparisons are done, firearms are very specific and unique and they make unique character, leave unique characteristics, grooves, markings on these projectiles and shell casings. And so if something has changed from being the manufactured barrel on the Glock to an aftermarket barrel, they're not going to match. You will hear also testimony from the victims in this case that when they observed this firearm they all describe it as a long gun, not a short gun that a Glock is. A Glock is a handgun. They describe it as a long gun, which they describe also as they saw a pump action done by the gunman when he approached the porch and when he began shooting execution style, victim after victim after victim. You will hear, since Mr. Wesley Smith and Michael Keatley had this love for guns, that they spoke about gun shows that they would go to. They spoke about attachments that can be placed on guns. They spoke about modification kits. A modification kit that was new in 20, 2010 that Michael Keatley spoke to Mr. Smith about because it was going to make it easier for Mr. Keatley to shoot the firearm because after he sustained his injury from the robbery, he could still shoot a firearm as you're going to hear testimony from the witnesses, just not as easily as he could before that injury. And so you will hear that this modification kit that Mr. Smith and Michael Keatley discussed is a modification kit where a Glock is slid up into this. Judge, we object, can we approach? Yes. All right, those headphones allow Michael Keatley to listen in to the sidebar as the attorneys were up there at the bench talking with his honor, addressing that objection outside the hearing of the jury. How do you think the state is doing so far with its opening statements presentation? Let me ask my guest. He is a former prosecutor, also practicing criminal defense attorney in Fort Lauderdale. Brian Silber is on the program. Uh, Brian, what's your assessment so far of the state, please? So as, as I listened to the uh, opening, I wish it was shorter. I wish it was a little bit more succinct. 
But I'm wondering, what's the defense going to say? Why did this case result in a hung jury? It sounds like they have a lot of evidence against him. Uh, you know, so I think the, the defense opening is going to be very enlightening. Uh, it, it just strikes me with what they have. How did they have a 10 to 2 not guilty, uh, you know, breakup? Um, so I, I think there's a lot of questions that uh, we're going to hear come out uh, just soon enough. But I think the prosecutor is doing the a good job. Could, oh, sorry, Brian, I didn't mean to step on you. There, there's a little delay. Is That's there anything okay. you think the state could be doing better in its open? I mean, just in terms of style, I like a very passionate, quick, to the point. I think when lawyers give very long openings or very long closings, the jury fades out. I mean, just look at our viewers and look at yourself. How many times did you look down at your phone? Did you look the other way? Maybe you lost your attention. Uh, when I give an opening or a closing, I really like to be succinct and give them the bullet points, not, not the uh, lengthy version. But other than that, I think she's laying out a very good case which makes me question it because there was a hung jury the first time around. Right, and, and, and the split is according to Michael Keatley's former attorney. She's the one who's saying that was what the split was. So um, just you know, putting that out there, she was tremendous. I have to tell you, Leanne Gowdy was a really, really great advocate. She's on the bench now in Florida. She's a judge, so obviously not representing him now in this case. So as you said, we have yet to see what his defense team does. We're gonna squeeze in a break while they're at the sidebar there. Don't go anywhere. More Court TV Live coming up for you right after this. I thought, this is really bizarre. A wealthy businessman loses the love of his wife. He was not going to accept the fact that she was sleeping with someone else. And then loses control. He poured gasoline on his body and set him on fire. The tale of a love triangle that ended in tragedy. Every murder comes down to one or two things. It's either profit or passion. Someone they knew with Cameron Hall. All new episode tonight, 7, 6 Central. Oh, my this man wanted vengeance. I'm just telling you, they're, they're requesting me to fly out. The guy came and put the gun on his head, and then the guy shot him. This is a case of misidentification, unreliable eyewitness testimony, and circumstantial evidence. They shot an ice cream man. He shoots an ice cream man. testimony throughout this case about conversations that Mr. Smith had with Mr. Keatley regarding firearms. In addition to all of the ballistic evidence in this case and how I previously discussed with you how um, the aftermarket barrel could be attached to a Glock and how that projectile, Miss Clark cannot say, came from the Glock. You will also hear evidence in this case that multiple searches were found on Michael Keatley's laptop computer regarding aftermarket barrel attachments. As law enforcement continues on with their investigation after conducting multiple interviews, collecting multiple pieces of evidence in this case, following lead after lead, sending evidence off ultimately for testing, they also learn that the day after the shootings, Michael Keatley takes his father's van to be painted. To have the color of his father's dark colored minivan changed. So on November 26th, Michael Keatley makes contact with Mr. Henry Bose. Mr. Henry Bose, who lives in Tarpon Springs and conducts a painting, a car painting business out of his home. And Mr. Keatley arrives at Mr. Bose's home. Mr. Bose is not there, but Miss Carrie Bose is, and she was not expecting Mr. Keatley that day, the day after Thanksgiving. And she usually, if customers are gonna be coming to their home since the business is out of their home, Mr. Bowes will tell her when customers are gonna be arriving. Mr. Keeley arrives at their property with this dark colored minivan. 
that is all solid dark blue. Mr. Bose is not there, so Mr. Keatley proceeds to clean out the inside of his van. Even though the inside of his van is not going to be painted, the outside of his van is going to be painted. He cleans out the inside of his van where multiple bags of trash are taken out and placed where, Mr. where the Bose family keeps their trash. He then also begins to wash the outside of his vehicle that's about to be sanded down and painted. And he assists Mr. Bose in all of this. He assists Mr. Bose in sanding down the vehicle with a handheld sander. And he and Mr. Bose work until the late, late hours, going into Saturday morning. And Mr. Keatley stays there and helps him work on this vehicle. He doesn't drop the car off, go home, and come back and pick the car up when it's painted. <clears throat> he stays there all night. He, sleep, in fact, sleeps on the couch waiting for the vehicle to be done. And the, the plan was to change the vehicle color. It was going to become no longer one solid color. It was going to be two-toned. So it was navy on top and it was a tan bottom. And this was done the day immediately preceding the shootings. He in fact wakes up Mr. Keatley and unwraps the vehicle himself the next morning after he was done sleeping at the Bose home and after he had completed helping Mr. Bose with the job that he had hired him to do. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, the surviving innocent victims in this case will take the witness stand and tell you exactly what they remember happening to them those early morning hours of that Thanksgiving morning that the pieces of evidence that were seen at Ocean Miss Court corroborate the victim's statements, that there was one gunman with one gun, and those projectiles matched a projectile taken from the defendant's property, and those shell casings found at Ocean Miss Court matched the shell casing in the burn pit at the Keatley property and that the defendant was obsessed with getting revenge on the individual that he thought that robbed him. He was going to get revenge on November 25th of 2010. And the state's confident that at the conclusion of this case, you will find the defendant, Michael Keatley, guilty as to all charges. Thank you.